Professore Donadoni, Presidente Conte, Presidente Maffei. Uh, I'm very honored to be invited here, and I beg your pardon that I speak in English. My Italian has not developed far enough, but uh, I uh, permit me to talk in English. My subject is Egypt and the Mediterranean world. It is too big to be covered with uh, precision. Uh, therefore, I will concentrate more to the Eastern Mediterranean. And what I can present here is more a sketch. And many things have to be simplified and uh, have to be followed up by more, with more precision in a written uh, work. Anyway, what I want to say is that Egypt, according to many Egyptologists, does not owe its success story as a civilization uh, to uh, its splendid isolation in the Nile oasis. No. Egypt uh, was always connected also to the Mediterranean environment, especially to the Near East. Uh, Egypt uh, received from the Near East uh, the Neolithic uh, development. The Delta Neolithic is purely in its initiation stage a uh, Near Eastern affair by population, influx, and also by culture. The Delta Neolithic of Merimde, the oldest stratum of Merimde, is purely Near Eastern, uh, on, based on uh, pottery Neolithic AB and uh, even with uh, Natufian uh, tradition. Whereas the Sahara Sudan Neolithic uh, reached the Nile Valley in a more southerly position in the northern Sudan. Uh, this is just uh, to show you the by pottery uh, that uh, uh, there is a lot of Egyptian uh, Near Eastern uh, ceramics to be found in Merimde and also the Delta Calcoliticum, um, the Delta uh, Middle Bron uh, Early Bronze Age one, is more or less influenced by the Near East and. We also have to imagine that a lot of population uh, influx happened in this time. All these, uh, these uh, sites which you see on this map are more or less uh, uh, influenced uh, by Near Eastern imports, but even by Near Eastern populace. Um, this still belongs to the primeval stratum of Merimde, showing that it, is, uh, it has a tradition of the Natufian uh, Lithic, but also the Natufian population. Um, this is a photograph of the excavations of the University of Krakow in uh, Tel El Farcha in the Eastern Delta, uh, one of the biggest sites uncovered uh, thus far. It belongs to the uh, Bhutto Mahadi culture, which is a calcolithic early Bronze Age culture uh, influenced by Near Eastern uh, culture. Well, we have to imagine that the eastern part of the delta was always influenced genetically by Near Eastern intruders or in immigrants. Uh, this was, of course, a problem for the moment a pharaonic state was uh, uh, created, and therefore um, Egypt, in its earliest phase of history, tried to impose a very strict control of uh, influx. Uh, uh, this is the famous Nama palette, but you see uh, in the lower parts that um, the uh, enemies, the enemigos, are mainly uh, people of Near Eastern stock uh, to be clapped down, to be uh, killed. And, uh, uh, but Egypt uh, imposed also strict uh, 
uh, control on its borders uh, uh, by emptying borderland, borderland like Nubia and borderland like the Sinai Peninsula were emptied of people. In the dynasty one and two, there was no uh, body living there anymore. And on top of that, the pharaohs also by magic uh, tried to impose their control over the borderland. This is uh, um, pharaonic uh, inscriptions uh, on, on the Sinai showing a magical figure of pharaoh clubbing down a foe from uh, the Eastern Mediterranean. Well, but Egypt needed uh, more or less its neighbors uh, because it was in need of resources. The growing pharaonic state was in need of, of uh, coniferous woods, of copper, uh, of pitch, of oil, of wine. Uh, all this was uh, to be imported uh, and therefore Egypt uh, uh, I mean, initiated uh, contacts, particularly with the Lebanon, especially with Byblos. Very early, sent uh, prestige goods to the princes of Byblos in order to receive the uh, wood it needed for constructions, but also timber for building boats. In the temple of uh, uh, Sahure, you see uh, a narrative of how the Egyptian fleet brought to Egypt uh, um, people from the Near East uh, with beards. But they are not slaves, as written very often in Egyptian uh, textbooks, uh, Egyptological textbooks. No, you see these people with long beards and uh, this uh, um, headband uh, on the steering oars of the ships so there were sailors, and we may guess also shipbuilders. Egypt was in need of expertise how to construct these boats, and therefore they were also called the Bublite boats. 150 years later, at the end of the fifth dynasty, on the Unas Causeway, you see another display of pharaonic seagoing boats. They were manned mainly by Near Easterners, with beards, with long uh, hair, with uh, headbands. And uh, it was very clear that this was the expertise the pharaohs needed in order to build up their trade emporium. Um, very near to the easternmost Nile branch at uh, Tel Ibrahim Awad, uh, it's very interesting that a Dutch expedition found a temple. But what a kind of temple. It was the prototypical temple of the early Bronze Age in the Levant. A broad room temple uh, with, uh, to be entered uh, on the long side uh, with a podium, a cult podium against the back wall in the midst. It was later transformed uh, into a bent axis temple. Both temple types are near Eastern. They are not Egyptian. So we may imagine that in the Eastern Delta, lift people from the Near East, uh, surely acculturated, uh, uh, strongly acculturated, but performing their rituals uh, and having their architectural traditions upkept uh, for a long, long time. Well, uh, in the first intermediate period, at the end of the Old Kingdom, there was a, a crisis, not only in Egypt, and um, unfortunately, Egyptologists don't look far enough. Uh, this crisis was uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean uh, to be found uh, on a bigger basis. Uh, it was, uh, we know now, a problem in a climate. A, a dryness uh, happened, a strong dryness. And uh, this drought can be found, as um, I just was told by Professor Fikri Hassan, formerly University College London, in, who, who is coring uh, the um, Fayum Lake. He told me that the Fayum Lake was completely dried out in this period. And we also ha have pollen profiles in uh, the Jordan Rift Valley. And it was a period of drought. Uh, and uh, this may explain a part of the crisis, not only in Egypt, but also in the Levant, 
and uh, uh, it explains also the downfall of the pharaonic economy because it depended on imports and also uh, to some extent on exports. So uh, if there was nothing to be distributed in, internal in Egypt, uh, the pharaoh's power went down. Well, uh, what I wanted to show you uh, is that um, Egypt uh, fragmented, the state of the pharaohs fragmented quickly in this time of the first intermediate period, 2150 to about 2000 BC, and uh, several polities developed, uh, some of them becoming kingdoms, but the, we don't know much about the northeastern delta. Uh, little is known about it, no inscriptions, nothing, but we have uh, from the 11th dynasty, from the reign of Nebhepetre Mentuhotep, around uh, shortly before 2000, he was a king who united again Egypt to a single state, and uh, in the tomb of one of his generals, his name is Intef, uh, there is a representation of a siege of a town defended by Near Easterners with a with yellowish skin, long hair, uh, headband, uh, and uh, um, they are defending a walled town. Well, at that time, there were no walled towns in the Levant. It was the time of the uh, early bronze, middle bronze, intermediate, or also called early bronze four period, when um, this area was uh, inhabited by nomadic uh, population, mainly nomadic population. And uh, only the northern Levant, uh, uh, of course, urban life uh, uh, still can be found. However, uh, we don't see in this narrative anything which uh, shows a sea-bound expedition. And uh, my guess is that these are inhabitants of the northeastern delta of uh, a population which lived here since a long time of Asiatic origin containing Asiatic uh, habits and culture. And it was against them that uh, Nebhepet Re Mentuhotep uh, started uh, to make his campaigns. Well, there was a problem with the northeastern border of Egypt uh, because uh, it was inhabited by a population mainly of Near Eastern origin. And in order to impose strict control over this uh, border population, border area, the pharaohs started to um, make a, a kind of colonization attempt. Already, perhaps in the late uh, first intermediate period, but particularly in the 12th dynasty, we have uh, evidence of planned settlements uh, inhabited most likely by Egyptian farmers. Uh, uh, and uh, the main proponent of this policy seems to have been Amenophis, uh, not uh, Amenemhat I. Uh, we found in Teletaba, in the northeastern delta, a planned settlement of considerable size uh, with uh, completely, um, I mean, uh, model-sized uh, uh, um, uh, flats for families, not more than 27 square meters. And uh, this uh, was a part of the colonization policy of uh, this dynasty, and most likely there were much more, many more such settlements. Anyway, uh, Amenemhat II, uh, um, he started to make, uh, obviously according to his annals, uh, sea-bound expeditions to the Near East and to Cyprus, and uh, partly to plunder, but partly also to make uh, commerce. Uh, um, Egypt started to expand in its uh, commerce in the Levant, and the commerce, of course, went along uh, from coast to coast uh, and needed many harbors where ships uh, were able to find shelter. Uh, but also, uh, the Aegean reached Egypt uh, with imports uh, from the early 12th dynasty onwards already. Uh, the Egyptians, uh, however, were xenophobe by origin. Uh, names of, of uh, tribes, names of towns, names of uh, 
chieftains were written on statues or on pots and they were smashed. And this is uh, the way, the magical way to extinguish uh, potential enemies uh, of Egypt. Uh, but again, Egypt was in need of its neighbors, for their expertise, especially on the Sinai for, uh, for uh, mining. Uh, and uh, we have here the representation of the brother of the Prince of Regenu. Regenu is a general name for the Southern Levant. And uh, the brother of the Prince of Regenu accompanied Egyptian expedition under Amenemhat III. And uh, we, uh, we may suppose that miners accompanied Egyptian expeditions and uh, uh, they made a fantastic invention which still is among us, it's the alphabet. Uh, uh, the alphabet was invented in the 19th century BC by m simple miners and uh, using uh, a pharaonic script uh, but uh, uh, giving it a Canaanite sense, so to say. Uh, the alif, um, the first letter in the alphabet was formed according to the Egyptian sign of a bull but it is not a red car, it is red as Alif, is a bull. And so all the necessary letters were used in order to create a short uh, uh, hand kind of writing as a kind of um, imitation of Egyptian habits to write on stelae wishes to the uh, mistress of the turquoise mines, the goddess Hathor, which whom the Canaanite miners addressed as Baalat, the mistress. And uh, thus, in the 19th century BC, uh, this alphabet was invented, which many hundred years later only uh, gained such a success and such an importance. But it is an invention which uh, really um, cannot be underestimated. It is a fantastic invention which moved uh, the communication system of the ancient world and still lives with us. Well, uh, during uh, the th time of the 13th dynasty and the second intermediate period, Canaanites settled in the delta, first with the blessing of the pharaohs, a subject of the pharaohs, but very soon they got independent, ha had their own politics and used a weak part of the Egyptian uh, Middle Kingdom in order to grab the power and uh, started to form a policy, polity in the North Eastern Delta. But it is interesting that also there is a site in the Northwestern Delta and there is a void in between. And uh, I originally thought this is a cultural province, but I found out that also in the Middle Kingdom there are no sites in this void. And uh, the explanation is that most likely there was a sea incursion at the time, which rendered for many hundred years this part of the delta not uh, uh, habitable. Well, uh, relation with Byblos in the time of the 13th, 14th dynasty, dynasty were fostered. We have here a seal uh, impression of, uh, with the name of a prince of Byblos, who is already known. His name is Yapashemu Abi. Uh, and this is a Byblite type of seal, according to uh, Dominic Colon from the British Museum. Here is the name on the, uh, on the uh, schemata of the of the uh, Prince of Byblos. And it's interesting that in this time, this prince doesn't date to the 12th dynasty, but to the late 13th dynasty, perhaps already 14th dynasty, as uh, Karin Kopetsky from the Austrian Academy found out. And it is a period when princes in the Levant uh, took over the title of a mayor or of a governor. Uh, the Prince of Byblos, the Prince of Komidi, the Prince of Ugarit. Uh, and it seems that they somehow had a close relationship to Egypt for a while. This is a, um, a cylinder seal impression uh, of a Prince of uh, 
uh, of Ugarit found, however, in Alalach. In the Le Levant, prestige goods were copied uh, uh, in, uh, and the Egyptian culture had a very impressive uh, um, impact on the local uh, industries. On the other hand, uh, also Egypt was on the receiving side, a know-how in uh, metallurgy and also in the pottery production uh, came to Egypt via the Canaanites, who were superior in these technologies. But Egyptian motifs appear in Ebla and in other uh, places in the Near East, uh, and uh, there was a kind of uh, not koine, but uh, a strong influence uh, on both, from both sides. Egyptian prestige goods were sent uh, to the courts in the Levant, but later in the Hyksos period, it seems that royal tombs in Egypt were plundered, and the plunder was traded with the Levant on a large scale. Well, this is the site of Tel Etaba, the biggest town in the Eastern Mediterranean in the second intermediate period, so this means around um, in the 17th and 16th and 15th century. It gained the size of 250 hectares, which is twice the size, more than twice the size of a Syrian royal town. And we also don't know uh, about uh, towns in Egypt, which were at the same size at that time. Uh, this size was uh, uh, gained by extensive trading and uh, this acquires the means uh, uh, and attraction of people to live here. Uh, the town, uh, the basis of the economy of this town was a harbor basin which could uh, house or moor more, several hundred ships according to the Stela of Camose. The settlement clustered around this uh, harbor basin but soon uh, ga gained larger size. Uh, Canaanite cults moved to Egypt uh, by, with this Canaanite uh, population, uh, such as this seal cylinder, which was cut mm -hmm. locally according to Edith Porada, late Edith Porada. It, is, uh, it shows uh, the northern Syrian storm god, Baal Zephon, uh, as a patron of the sailors and as uh, um, the one who uh, controls the sea, he is above the sea, uh, the the uh, snake yam represented in the sea. And this representation is, of course, very important and uh, meaningful for a harbor town of this size. Also, temples of Egyptian, of uh, uh, Near Eastern style uh, can be found here. Here, a broad room temple with a big niche. It was one of the biggest temples of the Middle Bronze Age with uh, 32 meters length here a bent axis temple again, uh, opening towards the east. Uh, but what most importantly here is an altar, an inflammation altar, and tree peats, and on the altar we found charred uh, acorns, and the oak tree is not native in Egypt, it was imported. And the oak was uh, practically synonymous with the goddess Asherah, and Asherah has the epithet uh, of the sea very meaningful again for a harbor town. But we also have a palace um, which has Near Eastern features. To the left you have the palace uh, coup of Ebla and our palace and the Ebla palace share common features like this southern court behind double walls uh, with uh, a kind of tower, a staircase tower projecting uh, to the uh, to the west, and inside the courtyard you have a kind of uh, a pilaster or a, maybe a kind of platform uh, which may have cultic uh, uh, functions, so we don't know. A similar uh, feature you find in the old Assyrian palace in Assur. So these are distinct Near Eastern features. Uh, it's not an Egyptian palace. It is most likely a palace which, uh, among others, was used by the Hyksos Chayan. And from the same ruler, we have uh, 
prestige objects sent abroad uh, to Bogatskoye, to Knossos, to Baghdad, or better to say to Babylon, the lion. And uh, we also found in this, connected to this palace, a fragment of a cuneiform letter translated by Franz van Koppen and Karen Radner. It's written in uh, a kind of uh, orthography which can be dated to the last decades of the old Babylonian Empire, which is very important for chronological reasons. Uh, and uh, this letter is important. Why? Because it may show, it may show that it was not in the New Kingdom that the Akkadian was used as a diplomatic language, but already the Hyksos, who were a Near Eastern population, introduced Akkadian as a diplomatic language and used it for lo long distance uh, uh, letters and diplomacy. Um, from the same palace, we think, we believe, is this diadem, which is now in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Uh, uh, it may be from a tomb from this palace. Anyway, we know all Awaris was finally conquered by the uh, 18th dynasty, by Ahmose, and uh, in no time, this new 18th dynasty, which was the creator of the new kingdom, was involved in Near Eastern politics. Uh, Tutmose, the Third, uh, finally, uh, he had uh, uh, in his 21st year uh, to encounter a coalition of uh, uh, northern Syrian states at Megiddo. He surprised this coalition, he defeated them. He took Megiddo after a length, lengthy uh, siege, uh, but he had to go out for campaigns every year practically because uh, uh, all these princes were influenced uh, under the, by the Mitanni Empire, or Mitanni Kingdom, which was the major anniversary, uh, adversary of the Egyptians at that time. And the Mitannians were able to bring the Syrian princes under their influence. And uh, took Moses had to battle every year practically for uh, quite a long time. And uh, in order not to to march from Egypt every season with a whole army northwards, he uh, decided to build up uh, a navy and a naval bases uh, along the Syrian coast. But he, to have the expertise, Egypt was originally in the 18th dynasty not a sea power. It came from Upper Egypt and uh, they needed the expertise. And in order to bring in expertise in naval capacities, he couldn't, uh, he couldn't ask Syrian princes who had the expertise to help him. No, he seemed to have uh, uh, made an accord with the uh, Minoan thalassocracy. It's very interesting that precisely in this time when this confrontation with northern Syria, with the Syrian city-states started, Egypt suddenly uh, has strong ties with the Minoan Thalassocracy. We find suddenly from the early reign of uh, Tutmosis III and Hatshepsut uh, representations of Minoan delegations to the Egyptian court with Minoan commodities like these Wafio cups, uh, or here in the tomb of Rechmire with other commode commodities. And uh, it seems that uh, Tutmosis III uh, was the, the very pharaoh who installed a very strong naval base in the northeastern delta, which he called Piero Nefer, Happy Suati. And Egyptology till now believes Piero Nefer was at Memphis, what is nonsense, uh, very big nonsense, uh, by the way, because uh, in the first half of the year, ships, seagoing ships, cannot travel up till. Memphis because of the period of drought where river navigation is very difficult. And already Spiegelberg and already uh, Georges Darissi proposed that uh, this uh, harbor had to be in the delta and indeed it seems we have found this harbor. Because here is an enormous uh, palace precinct from the time of Tutmosis III, 5.5 hectare large which is 
13 acres. It's an enormous palace compound. And uh, on the other hand, we have from the British Museum Papyrus 10056, uh, the information that Keftiu ships, a term which is only used in the Tutmosis, Tutmosis uh, three period, were moored and uh, maintained in the harbor in the port of Peronefa. And uh, what is most stunning is that the palaces were embellished with truly Minoan wall paintings, bull leaping, bull grappling, uh, emblems of the palace of Knossos, like the half rosette frieze or uh, the maze pattern. And bull leaping itself was never uh, painted on the walls of any other palace uh, uh, in this time, except now here in uh, this uh, Tutmosit palace. We believe that uh, at that time, this was the culmination of the rapprochement between Egypt and uh, the Manoan court. Also here you have a whole representation of a hunt, hunting scene. Felines are hunting bulls. Uh, uh, anyway, I cannot uh, go into details, it's very interesting, but uh, Egypt really uh, seems to have a heyday in its uh, relationship to, uh, to Crete at that time. And uh, soon afterwards, uh, um, problems appeared. The harbor was abandoned, and uh, uh, for uh, one generation or two, and it seems that under Amenhotep III, this harbor was revitalized. It was uh, Amenophis, son of Hapu, a sage, a high official, who got the order to uh, refurbish, to fortify the Nile mouth. And, and this is what he did. And it was also Harimhap uh, uh, who refurbished uh, these harbors with an enormous fortress. Uh, why? Because at that time, peer raids appeared. The, fir the first sea peoples, uh, people displaced in their original homes, probably coming even as far as from the Western Mediterranean to the Eastern Mediterranean and harassing um, coastal towns, entering the Nile mouths, and Egypt uh, did everything to uh, counteract. Uh, uh, Horemheb uh, made a strong um, fortification, but in the time of Horemheb, there was also the confrontation of Egypt and the Mitanni Empire, uh, which uh, was uh, continued uh, by Seti I and finally by Ramses II. Uh, who, uh, and at that time, Egypt decided to put the epicenter of its activities, of its control center, so to say, to the Eastern Nile Delta to be near, nearer to the uh, crisis centers. It was Ramses II who, who confronted the Hittites at the famous Battle of Kadesh uh, early in his reign. Uh, he hardly escaped with his army. He could hardly save his army. But... Uh, uh, ten years later, or a little, a decade later, a peace deal was struck, and also in the meantime, uh, the hostilities ceased, calmed down, and it is the first time that two superpowers concluded such an important treaty, which lasted at least two generations, uh, uh, if not longer. Uh, for the Hittites, it was convenient because a new player in the arena of uh, world politics, the Assyrians, appeared. Uh, well, uh, I think I have passed my time. Uh, I will, may stop here. I just would like to quickly mention that another world crisis uh, uh, happened. It is too interesting to leave it out. Another world crisis happened, uh, in, which can be found in the complete eastern Mediterranean. Uh, not only in the eastern, in the complete everywhere in the Mediterranean. Uh, it seems a part of the reasons were, was again a drought period of drought, uh, but uh, we know of migrations of uncomparable uh, size at that time. Libyan tribes moved towards Egypt, uh, but also the sea people were a part of this crisis, uh, searching for new, uh, for new uh, homes, uh, uh, and uh, they tried to assault Egypt, the conquered coastal 
uh, the coastal Levant, which Egypt couldn't regain, and it was uh, Meriem Ptah and Seti and uh, Ramses III who opposed this uh, influx, but they could not in the long run. Mm -hmm. The Philistines settled in coastal uh, Philistia, and uh, like here, and then were Shosu Bedouins and uh, different tribes, um, Phoenicians came to the south. Egypt had to abandon its colony, uh, Canaan completely. And uh, Israel appeared also, the Proto-Israelites. Uh, um, and it is interesting that at that time, precisely in the 12th century, when the house type, the famous forum house appears in, uh, in uh, the Levant, uh, which is the prototypical house type of the Israelites, but probably also of, of other Iron Age populations. It, at the same time, it appeared in Egypt, in the temple precinct of Aya and Horemheb. Uh, and they were most likely made by prisoners of war, uh, captured by Ramses III uh, in uh, the desert of Seir, and uh, they were distributed along the temples. And, uh, uh, it's the first time that we have a direct evidence. We cannot say it's an evidence for the proto-Israelites, but at least it was a population living with the same culture. And uh, at that time, or by the way, the ethnogenesis has not yet been terminated. Well, uh, I would like to mention shortly also that in the Wadi Tumilat, uh, we have um, information by the Papyrus Anastasis VI that uh, Shosu Bedouins of Edom entered uh, at the end of the 13th century BC, shortly before uh, the 12th century, asking to, for, uh, to proceed till the pools of Pitom. And here we have uh, an enormous paleo lake, uh, which should be identified with the pools of, or the lakes of Pitom. And uh, what is interesting is that in the, this very period and in this uh, time when it seems that uh, the proto-Israelites appeared also in Canaan, we have evidence of Semitic names, of Semitic uh, toponyms that nobody took attention about it. Semitic toponyms uh, uh, appear in Ramesside papyri from the Wadi Tumilat. So we have not only Jeku, which is maybe an, from an older generation, but uh, Brechot, the, lake, the lakes, or Seger, the enclosure, or Gesem, which Sarah Groll suggested is the name of, uh, of uh, Goshen. At least it is a, an enormous lake, again, where uh, strong waves uh, can be found, and uh, besides other Semitic toponyms. And it is very likely that... Uh, Semitic toponyms were coined by Egyptian scribes only in an area where a Semitic-speaking population lived. And the question is, who were these people? Were they survivors of the Hyksos period several hundred years ago? Or were they newcomers, very interesting newcomers? And with this, I stop. Thank you very much.